First of all, everybody, disclaimer. I am not an archaeologist. I'm not a historian. Uh, so the things that I will be putting forward today will be gleaned from study of the topic from various sources. Um, if you are an expert, it would be um, good to um, compare and contrast uh, the uh, things that we, we look at this evening uh, with maybe your expert opinion. So what we're going to look at is how archaeology supports the biblical record. And, and that wording is very specific because we have the Bible in front of us and we as Christadelphians here at Rugby use various techniques to, to lay the foundations and support an understanding of Scripture so that we can live our lives by the, the message that we find in it. And there's various ways that we do that. Archaeology is just one of them. I'll just put several on, on the screen here. So prophecy is one that we use very commonly, um, looking at the things in the Bible that talk about future events. Um, those of, some of those events have already happened, and we see that the record was written prior to those events, and therefore we can um, deduce from that that there's a divine writer behind the scriptures. We can look at the harmony of scripture, and we can look at, right from Genesis through to the New Testament, a, a thread which is common, and a consistency which is common uh, between uh, the, new, the Old and the New Testament. And so looking at the harmony um, of Scripture. Uh, we can look at the Jews and the, the people that the Bible is centred around, the people of Israel, and they themselves are witnesses to a God. And it talks about that in various uh, places. And we've, we have sessions that we run from this platform that, that talk about um, Israel or the Jews as witnesses to God. It's a really interesting topic. But the thing that we're going to look at today is archaeology. Now, what you can't do is go and pick up a rock or an artifact and say, this demonstrates what the hope of the Bible is. You can't do that. What you can do is you can pick up a rock or an artifact, something that's um, excavated, and you can say, wow, this supports the record of Scripture. This is another piece of the puzzle which supports the understanding and the veracity of the record of the Bible. And that's really what we're going to, to look at today. So the, the official definition of archaeology is the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. And so we will be looking at various of those this evening, none of them in immense amount of depth, and I would recommend that you go and um, go to the British Museum, potentially. Uh, there's plenty in there that you could go to after this to get more depth and analysis of the things that we'll talk about today. So what we're going to do is we're first of all going to establish um, some artefacts or some um, archaeological finds which um, demonstrate um, the, the uh, clarity and accuracy of Scripture itself. Again, the, looking at the caves of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls is, again, a topic in itself. So we will be skirting a lot of these topics. Uh, we will be looking at the patriarchs. We'll be starting in Genesis and looking at some of the things that link to the patriarchs. We'll be then moving on to look at Assyria, which was a great power at the time um, of, uh, um, of Israel and the kings um, and the kingdoms that we see written of in the history books in the Old Testament. And, and we will look at some artefacts related to Assyria. We'll then look at some relating to Babylon. And, um, and then we'll conclude by looking at Rome. So essentially, uh, just going through the, the, uh, the history of the Bible and, and picking a few elements that, that give us an indication that the foundation that we have that this is the word of God is, is so. So let's um, start then by going to uh, the, the west bank of the Dead Sea. Travel with me now to um, the north and western shore of, of, um, of the Jordan, to Qumran, um, a, 
a fairly desolate um, landscape as you can see here we're not particularly good on this slide here but you can see this slightly blurred picture is um, the mountainous region um, there with some caves in the side um, of the of the of the mountainside and it is um, thought that a an amazing discovery of um, some uh, some pots with with uh, manuscripts in were identified first of all by uh, Bedouin cousins who were in the area looking after um, flocks, goats, whatever, um, the details of which I don't have to hand. Um, and they came across um, seven scrolls in cave number one. Um, and over the years, that number has grown um, in, in various caves in that region. Um, between 1947 and 1956 and it has completely changed the the way in which um, study of the text of the Old Testament has been has been um, had done we've added um, so much more um, um, detail to um, the the manuscripts that were available at the time so in 1947 um, Dr. Uh, John C. Um, Trevor um, he was doing some research, um, he was uh, working for an oriental research um, uh, uh, department and he was interested in what these, these scrolls um, um, said. Uh, they, were, they were sold to market traders so they could easily have been lost. These, these scrolls were, were you know, very briefly in the hands of you know, local market traders but got into the hands of scholars and, and they found that there was some really clear uh, links with some other manuscripts, the Nash Papyrus, um, uh, which was a really old manuscript at the time, and there were some amazing uh, similarities between them. The dating of these scrolls was to uh, the last um, three centuries BC, which is really um, close to, uh, well, it was the oldest um, um, dating of these scrolls. Most of them were Hebrew, some Aramaic um, was found in the scrolls that, that, uh, and, and the manuscripts that were found. Um, for those of you who are interested, there's a really good website. I'm not sure anybody's come across this before. Um, but if you just uh, Google um, the Great Isaiah Scroll, which was one of the most preserved and intact scrolls found um, in the Dead Sea, there's this website which allows you to essentially scroll forward and backward through um, the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls, uh, the Isaiah Scroll, and you can highlight elements, and I've done that here. You can just click on these elements, and it, it shows the verse, and it gives the translation in English. And so this one here, Isaiah 53, which is a really important um, chapter when talking about and prophesying of Jesus, and it reads, Surely he has borne our sufferings and carried our sorrows, yet he considered him stricken and struck down, by God and afflicted. And so the, the, um, the, the radiocarbon dating of all of these scrolls particularly kind of sets them between um, 356 to 103 BC. It's very specific, isn't it? I'm not sure how specific and what, how they could be so specific about those start and end dates. Uh, but then there's also scribal dating as well. So looking at the, uh, the, the text um, and that's set it to about 150 to 100 BC. So really um, amazing um, accuracy and also um, the age of those manuscripts um, was, was really important. A lot of the, the manuscripts they were using prior to that were AD something or other. They were like, they were many hundreds of years um, later. Um, there's also, if you're interested, you can look at, there's a particular um, uh, um, commentary about the the, um, the differences that were found, particularly in the Isaiah scroll, um, and it, 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 um, it pulls them all apart and says, what were the differences between the, the manuscripts that existed at the time and the, and the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls? And it comes down to um, uh, very minor uh, changes in spelling or in, 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 in grammar, and then there's one word, which I think is the word light, which is, slight, which is, um, it, which is different within within uh, the, the Isaiah scroll to, to, to previous manuscripts. Very, very um, similar. I think it's, it's like 99 point something percent um, similar to, 
to those other manuscripts. And that shows us that the changes in the text have, have not occurred. And that the things that we are looking at today, which are translations probably, unless you're reading those, the great Isaiah scroll, which I presume you're not. Um, but if you're using um, a, a translation that is based on all of those, those manuscripts, you're getting a very accurate um, view of, of, of scripture. Now, there's also various other manuscripts that have been found as well. So if you're looking now at the New Testament in the 1930s, there's the Chester Beatty papyri, uh, which um, was found in a, a Coptic graveyard, apparently, and illegally um, smuggled and, tra and traded. There's a lot of illegal trading of manuscripts um, around this time. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a Wild West for, for, for trading of manuscripts. But in the 1930s, this was studied. Um, it was studied um, and, and publicized. And it shows uh, many portions of the four gospel uh, records. This was in Greek um, and has portions of each of the four gospel records. Um, and also it has um, part of Acts 30 as well. So again, the archaeological finds are establishing a foundation for the scriptures that we are reading every single day. The picture on the screen there is actually a picture of uh, the oldest part of the New Testament that's been found, which was dated to around about 120 to 140 AD, which is um, part of what's well, called uh, Parchment 52, if, you're, if you like to give it its official name. Uh, it's a little fragment which is about the size of a credit card, um, and it's up in, um, up in the, the, the John Ryland Library up in Manchester. And on the front of it, uh, a front side, which I think it's this side, uh, which is the front, has got um, a portion of John 18, verses 31 to 33. And on the back of, the, of that, it's um, John 18, verses 37 to 38. And so we can see that the, the finding of all these manuscripts allows us to put together a picture of the original text and to to uh, have great trust in the Bibles that we have on our laps and how they've not changed over time and that the things that we are reading are sound and are carrying um, the word of God. So let's move on then to the times of, of the patriarchs. So um, we're going to have a look at one in particular here, which is um, it's looking at, at, at uh, Abraham or Abram, as, it, as we are introduced to him um, initially. He lived in a place called um, Ur, which was an ancient civilization, and um, it was renowned for um, its great engineering, um, commerce, and wealth. And, and that was um, uh, found by Sir Leonard Woolley. So Sir, Sir Leonard Woolley in the early 20th century was very famous um, archaeologist um, who um, found various sites um, and this one he found uh, a ziggurat uh, which was at Ur um, and he also found many other aspects of, of this ancient uh, civilization. He found um, two-story housing which was obviously very advanced, um, have being able to um, put a uh, second story in, being able to, to hold the weight of a two-story house, so being able to have the civil engineering skills uh, to do that, uh, to have modern, well, I must say modern, um, sort of drainage systems, which um, were, were able to take waste away from, from housing and to be able to um, provide water. Um, they found lots of art and jewellery and, and gold. They found uh, contracts and receipts as part of the manuscripts. Uh, that they found uh, within Ur. Um, they also um, found this ziggurat, as I mentioned, and it, it gives a testament to uh, a scripture here that we, we've pulled out here, which just describes Abraham and, and the family of Abraham and what they would have, uh, uh, what, you know, where Abraham came from. So this is from Joshua, and he said to the people in Joshua 24, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. 
So they served other gods. Now, what were those other gods? And through the archaeological find, you can start to add colour to that statement. And the colour that gets added to that is, um, was, was uh, um, found in the 1920s, uh, where you had this ziggurat of Ur, which was excavated. And it was built by Ur-Namu, which was a king of, of Ur at the time, in about um, 2100 BC. And this um, ziggurat was there to worship um, the, uh, the god Nana, or um, Sin. I think Sin is in the Akkadian language. Um, and this was a moon god. And so this would have been, if you think about the time of Abraham, and just to add colour to reading of scripture, where was Abraham coming from? He was coming from this really civilised area um, with a really high class of living, um, with this uh, this these god system which that they were having though this worship and this huge ziggurat which um, uh, this is a um, a picture a, a depiction of it and then in the time of Saddam Hussein he then um, added around the side of it he then put a facade on the on the side of of this um, of this ziggurat and you can just see in the top there some of the original um, stonework but he he built around it in order to to kind of sharpen it up maybe make it look a bit cooler um so um we have this is you know something that that abraham would have been able to see abraham would have been able to look at uh, something like that and that was where abraham had come from that was his background so again um the, none of these artifacts none of these findings are saying um therefore you should believe the the scriptures but what they are doing is they're filling in the gaps and adding some colour to, uh, um, to, to the scriptural record, adding some colour behind Abraham coming from Ur, a, worship, a place where they worshipped gods. What were those gods? Well, we found some of the, the artefacts and the um, monuments that were built to those city gods of the time. Let's move on to the time of David now. Um, now and, and with David, we're going to look at a finding that was, ma was made um, a little bit more recently, I haven't noted down um, when, I think it was um, the 1900s that, that the Tel Dan um, steel was found. Tel Dan is in northern um, Israel. And this, this um, document, this um, uh, steel, was, was there to, uh, and thought to be um, by Haziel, who was a king in northern Israel, boasting over victories against the kings of Israel. And um, like most ancient steels and texts, that they are uh, poured over by experts a number of different times, and they all argue with one another as to what they say. Now, uh, I'm no expert, so I've, I've uh, picked up uh, some of the, the, the study on this. And as you can see, uh, one of the translations of this makes reference in, in line nine here to the house of David. And that's really significant because at the time that this was, um, this was discovered, there was um, very little evidence outside of, of scripture of the existence of the house of David. And people thought, yes, he may have existed as a, as a tribal uh, chieftain of the area, but um, not like this, this, this um, dynasty that is described in scripture. Um, but in, in this text here, we have a description of the house of David, and and also within within this we have mention of of other uh, other characters as well. Uh, it's actually off the side of the screen. I can't quite remember uh, who it is. So it's the, it details um, Jehoram or Joram, uh, who was an Israelitish king, son of Ahab, and it corroborates the events that were happening at that time. Um, obviously, bits of it are missing. It's not in the original state. Uh, I think somebody might have dropped it. Um, but uh, as you can see, we're starting to add some flavour to to the, the fact that e the existence of David um, uh, was, uh, uh, was found outside of Scripture. Now, this also will come out of the, the Misha steel, which we'll look at in, in, a, in a moment as well. Both of these, um, I'm not going to say that uh, absolutely this is um, uh, um, the house of David is is now um, uh, exhibited in in in, in um, 
in absolutely within within these uh, artifacts, but because there is some contention about what some of these words mean, etc. But many people agree that this, the writing of this, and comparing it with the writing on the the Misha steel as well, uh, that shows that there is a house of David, and the writing is very similar, and the referencing to it is 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 similar as well. So let's um, move on. So this is the house of David. You know, David now a character that we can look at um, um, in, in in scripture. Um, have I missed anything on that point? No, I haven't. All right. So what I want to do next is just uh, recap the the timeline of the of of Israel, just so you you re remember uh, why we go into look at Assyria because. Um, you can't necessarily see it, all of this, but on the left-hand side here we have Solomon. Obviously, we, before Solomon we have David. So that's when the when the um, nation of Israel is united, and then we have a split north and south. So we have Judah's kings here: Rehoboam, Asa, Jehoshaphat, etc. And along the top there we have Israel's kings. So these are the northern kings, um, and uh, so we have the ten tribes, and we have. Uh, Jeroboam, etc., Ahab, Jehu, some some big characters um, along the top there, and they are um, consecutive with. If you look at right at the top, you won't be able to see it, but you can see some some faint lines there. But those are the kings of Assyria. So you have people like um, Shalmaneser the um, third over there. You have um, over here. You have Sennacherib. Uh, both of those characters we are going to look at now. So if you can see Shalmaneser the third, let me just do this, see if you can see this. Can you see the little light? So here we are, there's a little light. Shalmaneser the third is consecutive with kind of Ahab and Jehu over here. And down here we have Sennacherib. Sennacherib is with Hezekiah down the bottom here. Okay, so Hezekiah, Sennacherib. Remember that, okay? There will be a test afterwards. Right, so let's move on to, to look at um, Assyria then. Assyria was, uh, was the greatest power um, at the time um, of kind of 800 to 600 uh, BC. It was a huge power which was taking over the Middle East. And as you can see here, the extent, the sweeping down from um, Egypt almost uh, over to um, India, over, on, over here up to the Caspian Sea, into modern day Turkey. Um, here as well. So a huge influence and, and power of the Assyrian Empire. And the northern Israel, um, Samaria, was besieged and taken in uh, 722. And you start to get um, uh, references to uh, these exploits within, within archaeological finds. And you start to see the influence of Assyria on north, you know, um, that, those northern tribes of Israel. One of those um, is, I believe, in the British Museum, which is the um, Shalmaneser's Black Obelisk, um, which is this very imposing um, 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 obelisk, which is no, no better word for it, really, than, than that, rather than asterisk, which is something different. Um, it recorded the um, exploits um, of uh, Shalmaneser III, and it um, allowed uh, them to kind of write down and proclaim the great um, conquerings of, of, the, of the nations around. Um, and one of, the in, one of the reasons that we're interested in this is that it shows Jehu bowing before um, captors. Now, in terms of the, um, the, uh, the interest for us, we can start to see that, um, that timeline and the existence of Jehu and particularly um, of, of the overthrow of the, well, actually, the, it says Jehu, the son of Omri. And as we know from the biblical record, uh, Omri was, house was overthrown by Jehu. Um, but we get the reference to these two characters, um, giving us um, evidence that these people, this is not fairy tales that we're reading in the history books of, of the Bible, but these characters did exist. And in fact, here we have a, one of those panels, um, and in the middle here we have that character that's described as Jehu, bowing down uh, before before the before the, um, the the captors. Now these events aren't explicitly written, uh, narrated um, in scripture, but what it does do is it starts to put um, artifacts which relate to Assyria, which was an immense power at the same time 
that Israel, those northern tribes of Israel, and characters like Jehu and Omri were, uh, were, um, were the, the, that we find in Scripture. Okay, let's move on to um, the ne- an- another one, which is this time it's to do with the it's um, it's the Misha steel, which is um, an interesting um, uh, artifact again linked to the the, te- the Tel Dan uh, uh, steel that we saw earlier with that reference to the house of David because there is a similar phraseology I think it's down here somewhere line 31 um, somebody who can can uh, speak that may be able to tell me but the, the phraseology of house of David is also found on line 30 and 31 uh, down the bottom there but it talks about um, and it's th- this this artifact if you want to go and see it um, I think Shalmaneser's Black Obelisk, that is in the, uh, is in the um, uh, British Museum. You can go and see that. Uh, if you want to go and see this, you have to go to France. So you might need to just be a bit careful with self-isolation afterwards. Uh, but go to the Louvre and you can go and uh, have a look at this, this artefact um, and, and see uh, the exploits of, uh, of, of Moab, essentially. It's also called the Moabite Stone uh, because of the, the characters that it um, talks about. Um, it was found in Dibon, um, um, near, near Jordan, and it talks about how um, this, this king, Misha, and he calls Misha the son of Chemosh. Chemosh is a god. All these characters we find in the Bible. In fact, let's turn to uh, 2 Kings chapter 3 to go and find um, reference to, to, to this character. Two Kings um, three and verse four. Uh, we have uh, a phrase here. Uh, we're not going to look at the context here, but we, it's, it's about Moab rebelling against Israel. Um, it's um, and that's that's important for the context of this stone as well. And it says, verse four, Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams. Uh, with uh, with the wool okay now if you were um, to look at the the translation of of this stone it talks about how Chemosh as a god was angry with Moab and how that he put them and allowed Israel to subjugate them for a time and so you know we see this don't we as as corroboration of two kings Um, and in in this stone we then have the turning aside, you know, you know that that um, that situation turned about, and the, the god Chemosh, um, which which we read of at the time of Solomon, um, Solomon uh, built um, and worshipped um, Chemosh. I think one of his wives was um, was keen on Chemosh, and therefore um, built um, um, worship places uh, for for that god. Um, but this um, inscription also mentions um, the fact that he is uh, he, he brought of the flock of the land. And um, again, in I think lines towards the bottom of this steel, it talks about uh, he, he brought of the flock of the land. And it links with the sheep master uh, that we see as the description of Misha. None of these things are absolute. None of the interpretations of these things are absolute. But they do add colour, don't they, to um, the things that we are reading in Scripture. The fact that Misha existed, and there's a stone that mentions him. The fact that Chemosh as a god existed. The fact that Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehu, all these characters were mentioned in... uh, Some of those characters were mentioned, Jehu particularly... Uh, mentioned in these um, inscriptions, adding colour to the things that we read of in, script, um, in, in Scripture. Let's also uh, move again with Assyria, but now um, looking towards the south of Israel. So that was um, looking at the, the north of, of Israel against um, <clears throat> the northern tribes and, and the things that were happening. But now let's have a look at, the, at what happened towards the south. And let's first of all have a look at the time of um, Sennacherib and the time of Hezekiah. So that's the time frame we're looking at now. So let's have a look at 2 Chronicles chapters 
32. Let's just have a look at a few uh, words here. <clears throat> so this is now talking about, if you remember on the timeline, we're down in the bottom left here, if you remember, Sennacherib. And um, uh, Sennacherib was around the time of Hezekiah. And um, here we read um, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, the incident of Sennacherib coming against Jerusalem and against Judah um, and taking some of those cities, but then coming up against um, Jerusalem with Hezekiah as the king. After these things, um, and after these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with the princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and, and they did help him. And they gathered together and stopped the fountains and the brook that ran from the midst of the land, saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And so we see a diversion of the water courses inside, to the, inside the city um, so that um, they, can, they can have water in the city, uh, but not outside the city where all of the amassed armies of Assyria would be. And let's just also have a look at um, another um, passage at the same time as this. So 2 Kings 20. This is just establishing some context for the things that we're going to look at. So 2 Kings 20 um, and verse 20. Um, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all, his, and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? OK, so we have this amazing um, a description of stopping the fountains and bringing the water in and the conduit and uh, the water that's brought inside the city. Now, there was a, a finding um, of a water course uh, with the stopping of the, the Gihon Spring. And I think the Gihon Spring is mentioned in verse 30 of the Chronicles record. Let me just double check that. Yes, this um, the same time Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down into the west side of the of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered and all in all his works. And so you have this uh, the, the stopping of the Gihon spring outside the city and the entrance to the Hezekiah's tunnel bringing the water into the city. And an amazing, if you were ever in Jerusalem, I'm sure people here have been there and actually walked through this. And if you were to walk through it, it would look um, a little bit like this. So uh, this is people walking through the, 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 um, the, the, the tunnel of, of Hezekiah. As you can see, the marks on the wall of them chipping out this, this tunnel. You know, thinking back to these are the marks that were made by Hezekiah and his, his men and women who, who got ready for the, the um, siege that Assyria was making on him and on the city of Jerusalem. And there we have, and I think they pan down, you can see the water um, at the bottom. Have they done that yet? Uh, can yeah. You saw that? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, and so you can see that water course coming into the city. Now, you can't go to a museum and see this because this is they can't really take this into a museum. You've got to go to Jerusalem and see this. Um, I haven't been myself, uh, but I'm sure many of you here in the room and um, around have, have been there and actually walked through that, that, that tunnel. Incredible, isn't it, to see that description in both um, Chronicles and in Kings of this tunnel being made, uh, the marks of the workmen being seen on the walls here, as you would walk through 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 that tunnel um, in in Jerusalem. Now, staying with this same scenario, the same situation, uh, we find that um, Sennacherib does have some great success in Judea in taking some of the the cities. Lachish being one of them. Um, there's a Lachish frieze um, in the British Museum as well, and that shows us the the things that happened in Lachish. But the one thing it doesn't show is the taking of Jerusalem. And there is, a, there is a prism which is called Taylor's Prism uh, or the Sennacherib's Prism. Again, in the British Museum, you can go and look at 
and it demonstrates the, the things that happened with the attack on Jerusalem by Sennacherib. But, uh, we have this amazing artifact, uh, the Taylor Prism, which describes with, with um, uh, great um, clarity the links between uh, the record that we have in Scripture and the things that were written on that, on that template, the, the diary of the, of the things that were happening um, at the time and from Sennacherib's point of view. And so we see, don't we, the, uh, the events in 2 Kings 20 and Isaiah 39, if, you're, if you want to note down, those are the, the, key, the key scriptures that relate to this. And this description of Hezekiah like a caged bird, but not talking about taking Jerusalem. Um, and it's, if you were to read scripture, um, that's not what happens. G um, Jer Jerusalem is not taken and the Assyrian armies are destroyed and Sennacherib and, and the armies return um, to his capital. So let's move on then. So that's Assyria. Um, now let's move to another great power that we find in scripture, um, that of Babylon. And we'll just look very briefly at Babylon. Um, so uh, many thought that Babylon um, was, was not a, a, a real city until um, they found it and discovered it um, in the um, 1800s, uh, 1895 to uh, 1914 was when archeologists uh, from, from Germany uh, went and, and found artifacts that related to to Babylon and in particular here is one which is and there's a few examples of this again some examples that you can find in the British Museum which um, uh, have bricks from the city which have the name of Nebuchadnezzar stamped onto it and if you were to look at Daniel chapter 4 it starts to add color to the time of Daniel a time when Daniel who was um, a noble in, in Israel was um, it was taken captive and, and lived in Babylon. And um, in Daniel chapter 4, we have this description. If I can find Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30 of, of the way that Nebuchadnezzar thought about this great city that, that he, had, he had built. The king Babylon said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom um, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. And then you find a brick, and on that brick it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who cares for Esgila and Ezida, eldest son of uh, Nebo Pileser, king of Babylon. And so you have, don't you, um, a, an artifact, something you can go and hold. Well, the museum probably wouldn't allow you to hold it, uh, but uh, something you can go and look at and hold, which has the name Babylon on it, has the name Nebuchadnezzar on it. All of these people we find in Scripture. Daniel spoke to him, in, was in that land, was in that great city, which was made of the bricks that we find in the British Museum. That's incredible to think of that, and it does, doesn't it, add. Um, the uh, sense of realism to to the, the things that we find um, in Scripture. Let's move hastily on to another um, major power that we find um, in in Scripture, which is that of Rome. Now, um, Rome was around in the times of of um, of Jesus. We know, don't we, the the imposition on the life of 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 those in in Israel at the time of Jesus and many thought that Jesus was there to to alleviate them from the rule of Rome at that time but things precipitated and they got worse and worse and there was a revolt by the Jews against the Roman power and around about AD 66 um, these this revolt against the Roman power got to a point where the Romans under um, um, a future emperor, which was Titus, would come and would, would um, uh, completely flatten the city and would burn the temple. Um, and in this incident, we see a depiction of it um, in the Arch of Titus. And again, not something that you can go to a museum and see, but you can go and see this in Rome, the Arch of Titus. And in AD 71, this was built as a victory parade um, depicting the spoils of the temple after the fall of Jerusalem. And it shows, as you can see, 
Um, this is just one section of it, but it shows a parade that goes through with um, the, the, uh, the artifacts that have been taken from the temple. And you can see there uh, the menorah there. And we, we think, don't we, of the, of the words in Matthew um, 24 when it talks about how the temple will be um, destroyed. Now, obviously, that's speaking of, of his te the temple of his body and, and, and um, him being resurrected. Uh, but it, it, that's the temple that Jesus was speaking to the people in. He was speaking to those, those people and, and talking about the, the word of God. He was sat in that temple. And that temple is something that is then depicted in the Arch of Titus after it's been destroyed. And this artifact here, uh, the menorah depiction here, is something that um, was, was used um, as contemporary depictions of, of Herod's temple and the, the, that symbol, that emblem of the state of Israel. They used that um, to help um, f find the depiction of that. And so we see, don't we, um, again, a, a major power. And there's so many artifacts which link um, to Rome. There's, there's uh, countless artifacts um, which, which testify to the existence of Roman emperors and events uh, within, within history. But that's just one taste, um, and a taste which we read of in Scripture being prophesied in, the, in this Olivet prophecy. Um, the, the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Um, Jesus went out and departed from the temple and the and disciples came to him and he showed them the temple buildings and Jesus said to them, See ye, um, ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not here be left one stone upon another and that shall not be thrown down. And he, show, he sat on the, the Mount of Olives and the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, um, when shall this thing be? And so this was pointing forward to that point, AD 70, that momentous event in the history of Israel. Um, the the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. Um, and here we see that parade being depicted on the Arch of Titus. So we've spent a bit of time um, together um, looking at various different um, things, um, none of which you'll be able to point out and go that that is demonstrating what the hope of the bible is that's not the point of our time together here the point of our time together is that the things that we find in in archaeology they they support and they provide um color to the events that we find in scripture they they show us that places and people and events that we read of in scripture um, are corroborated in other um, um, documents and in other artifacts that we find um, outside of Scripture. And so it fi it, we find another p puzzle piece that we can slot into place that allows us to be really confident that the hope of the Bible is true. So hopefully these things have been useful and hopefully it will spur you on and inspire you to go and look at that hope of the gospel. Go and look at how we should respond to it and how we should um, allow it to, to develop and lead our lives. Thank you.